Hello and welcome to the webinar on media use and care. The goals of this webinar are to help you understand the common components in cell culture media, some of the various limitations of cell culture media, and how to care for and use your media um, and get the most performance out of it. Now, of course, there are multiple factors that uh, indicate that cells need to be fed. You might notice your media getting a little bit yellow if it has phenol red. Uh, of course, the higher the density, the higher the cell concentration, uh, the more often you need to feed your cells. And of course, different cell types such as cancerous cells or high metabolism, uh, metabolizing cells might require uh, more feeding uh, than other cells. And of course, one of the ways that you can determine whether your cells need uh, feeding would be cell morphology. So I want to point out that uh, traditional media is, is, a, is media that uh, with a common formulation or a known non-proprietary formulation. And this is considered what's called a basal media because basal media will not support the growth and proliferation of cells until you add serum. Once you add serum, we have what's called a complete media, which is capable of, perform of promoting the growth and proliferation of your animal cells. I also want to mention that there are serum-free medias out there that are able to and capable of growing cells without the addition of serum. Uh, because complete media has uh, so much serum proteins in it, it is considered more forgiving. Um, it's a little easier to use with your animal cells, and your animal cells will forgive uh, some minor mistakes that you might make. I also want to point out that there's other medias out there, uh, for example, the advanced medias, which are reduced serum medias that are similar to, to traditional medias like RPMI 1640 or DMEM. They might have a few more additives in there, uh, and those additives allow you to grow cells at maybe 5% or 2% serum as opposed to 10%, so they can be advantageous for certain uh, uh, growth uh, conditions. Now, serum-free media is usually designed for specific cell types. It's usually designed for to grow suspension cells, uh, and a serum-free media is designed to promote the growth of cells without the addition of serum. So serum-free media is different than a basal media. A basal media is a, is a traditional media formulation prior to the addition of serum. Um, and uh, serum-free media generally contains all the components necessary for the growth and proliferation of animal cells. And I do want to point out that serum-free media is less forgiving uh, in terms of operator use and uh, what your cells will see because with serum-free media, the protein concentration is less, which means there's less of a protection of your cells when you're growing them in culture. I want to point out that most of the traditional uh, non-proprietary medias contain phenol red. Uh, many of the serum-free medias do not. Phenol red was originally added in media formulations as a pH indicator, because back in the day before Dr. Beckman invented the pH meter, measuring the pH was actually a difficult thing. So this was one way that you could use, uh, look at the color of your media to determine what the pH was. Uh, it's usually added at about 15 mg per liter. It'll give your media a red color. Uh, I've shown the uh, image of what, what uh, phenol red looks like up there in this slide, and I want to point out it's a highly conjugated molecule, and as such, it actually acts as a free radical scavenger. So one of the benefits of phenol red, in addition to being a pH indicator, is that phenol red acts as a radical scavenger and actually protects your cells and your media from damage due to light. So here I can, you can see in this little diagram that the color of the media will change according to the pH if your media has phenol red. We see a nice yellow color when the pH gets acidic below 7. We see a purplish color when the pH gets on the alkaline side, and we normally get that nice red color when the cells are growing at around neutral pH. I also want to point out that uh, the pH does change when you grow cells because as cells grow, they produce CO2 in the media. They also acidify the media because most animal cells grow anaerobically, 
which means that there's things like lactic acid that are produced by cell metabolism that's produced and, and placed into the media, and therefore the media gets acidified as cells grow. I just want to point out here's a chemical structure of estrogen, and if you remember the chemical structure of phenol red, phenol red is a mimic of estrogen, and I just wanted to make that point clear for the, some of those people uh, growing stem cells or some people growing maybe some female cell lines, you might want to be concerned about the estrogen effects of the addition of phenol red. Another thing I want to point out is that when somebody like Del Becco formulated DMEM, Del Becco's formulation is the formulation for DMEM, and any changes in that um, formulation need to be uh, indicated on the bottle or on the label of the media. As you can see here, this is a, a label for Del Becco's Minimal Eagles Media, and most of the uh, Eagles Media that was made when Del Becco formulated uh, DMM, he used one gram per liter glucose. Most people nowadays buy the four and a half gram per liter uh, glucose DMM, and that's because we're growing cells to higher density. We're growing more. Uh, uh, cancerous cell lines and so forth, so the cells have a need for more glucose. So it would have to say high glucose or 4.5 gram per liter glucose if that modification uh, were added to the bottle. Uh, likewise, DMEM did not have glutamine, so we generally would indicate whether there is or is not glutamine in the media. And also, Del Becco did not have sodium pyruvate in the media. It was determined after Del Becco formulated DMEM that sodium pyruvate helps uh, with the energy state of the cells, and if you add some sodium pyruvate, you get some more ATP. So it makes uh, the cells go through glycolysis a little better. So in any case, these additions would need to be on the formulation. So the changes would be noted. So when you pick a, a media, there's generally the standard media and then all the other modifications within that uh, uh, standard product, such as DMM. Here I just want to indicate that uh, media, the, the basal medias, the traditional medias, have a lot of components, in, in including inorganic salts and amino acids and vitamins and so forth. And you can find these in the catalogs um, or, or looking up the recipe for the media. Whether we, we make a, a media by rehydrating a dry powder or whether we purchase media or whether we add water or anything like that to cells or cell culture media or to cells. We need to have high quality water. We're generally using a water for injection for, for animal cell culture. Animal cell culture water is normally purified more than one way uh, and we need to remove uh, pretty much all impurities including uh, bio burden which might be things like endotoxins. So it's really important to have a high quality uh, uh, endotoxin-free, pyrogen-free water. We generally use water for injection to make cell culture media or if we're making solutions for cells. Cell culture media also uh, provides osmotic pressure, and osmotic pressure is one of those physical properties. If the osmotic pressure is too low, the cells will actually explode. If the osmotic pressure is too high, we generally crush uh, the cells. Generally, we grow cells at about 300 milliosmoles per kilogram. Uh, pH control is also important in uh, with a good cell culture media, and animal cells grow uh, with a pH around neutral or so forth, and so animal cell culture uses so sodium bicarbonate in order to maintain the correct pH of the culture. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Of course, media also provides nutrition with the amino acids and the vitamins and the sugars and other essential components that we'll talk about in one moment. So the pH is controlled by the addition of sodium bicarbonate, and that is the major buffer in cell culture media. Some media might have heapies or something like that, but heapies tends to be toxic to animal cells, uh, especially in the presence of light. The amount of CO2 you use depends on the media formulation. 
I want to point out that a cell culturist will calibrate their CO2 incubator so that the incubator itself reads 0% CO2 at ambient CO2 concentrations. So if the cell culturist is growing um, uh, cells in a 10% CO2 incubator, that would mean that the CO2 concentration in the incubator is 10% higher than what is in the atmosphere. This means, of course, that if you remove your cells from the incubator, put them on the microscope, put them in the biological safety cabinet, the pH of that media will become uh, increased due to the lower CO2 uh, that the cells see. And this is why oftentimes if you leave your cell culture uh, dish or flask out of the incubator for a period of time, if it has been all red, it turns purple. One of the things you can do is go back to that media formulation and determine the amount of sodium bicarb that's present in your media. And the idea would be then that you'd place the CO2 concentration of your incubator at the appropriate concentration for that sodium bicarbonate uh, concentration. So in other words, DMEM, which has 3.7 mg per liter sodium bicarb, you would want to use a 10% CO2 concentration where people who might be growing uh, F12 or RPMI 1640 that has a lower uh, sodium bicarbonate level, you might want to grow your cells in 5% CO2 um, above ambient. So down in the bottom of this slide, you can see a modified equation for the CO2 uh, and the bicarb and the pH. The idea is that with sodium bicarb, if we add CO2 to the media, we generate a proton, we push the equilibrium to the right, we generate a proton and acidify the media. If we add sodium bicarb or we remove CO2, we push the equilibrium to the left and we make our solution more basic. I think this is one area where people can improve and I think people often don't use the right CO2 concentration for the media that they're using. I also want to point out, of course, that other components such as uh, amino acids are important in a good cell culture media. Um, if you look at the list of essential and non-essential amino acids here, one of the things you'll notice is maybe my list is different than a traditional biochemist's list, and that's because if a cell does not make enough of an amino acid to be useful, um, we would still call that essential. And cysteine, glutamine, threonine are some of those amino acids that are really considered non-essential amino acids in a biochemistry textbook, but are considered essential amino acids in biochemistry. And the idea is that cells don't make enough to be useful. Glutamine is one of the most important amino acids. It's generally added at about 10 times the level of the other amino acids. It's often supplemented into media at the time of use. This will extend the shelf life of the media. It's added at a higher concentration, and that's because glutamine metabolism is, is, is where most cells get their energy. Much more energy is gotten from the, sponta or from the, the oxidation of glutamine based on the metabolism of glucose. So it's really important to have enough glutamine levels uh, but at the same time, we need to be aware that glutamine will spontaneously decompose to form ammonia. And uh, ammonia can be toxic to cells. And so uh, between the spontaneous breakdown of the glutamine and the use of uh, metabolic glutamine, we have to make sure we have enough glutamine in the culture media for cells to survive. One of my rec recommendations would be to switch from glutamine is something like glutamax. Glutamax is a dipeptide which is much more stable at room temperature than glutamine. The half-life of glutamine is only several days at 37 degrees where the half-life of glutamax can be significantly longer. Glutamine does not, uh, glutamax does not need to be stored at room temperature. Uh, it, it, can be, uh, it can be stored at room temperature where gluta, glutamine needs to be frozen and and, and frozen to maintain its stability. So glutamine has a couple advantages. It's really important for cell survival, but the drawbacks to glutamine are, of course, that its spontaneous breakdown can result in cell death. 
So um, if you want to maintain the energy status of your cells, one of my recommendations is to use Glutamax because it doesn't break down spontaneously. It breaks down uh, via metabolism only, which means there's more glutamine available for the cells and the cells get a higher energy status. Vitamins are very important, obviously. Uh, the fat-soluble vitamins generally are added to media via the serum. The water-soluble vitamins, the B vitamins, and so forth are added to uh, the basal medias. And these, are, uh, these vitamins tend to be the B vitamins and so forth. They're listed there in this table. A lot of these vitamins are also radical scavengers. They're conjugated, and they are targets for light damage to media. Finally, I want to mention that uh, there are salts, of course, that are present, and salts are important in media because they do promote the osmotic potential that's in media. Salts also help uh, increase dissolved gases. They help uh, cells in a lot of ways. They, of course, can be cofactors for enzymes. They can they can uh, affect membrane polarity and so forth. And 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 salts come in two varieties. We have the bulk ion salts and the trace elements. The trace elements are typically added about a thousand fold less than the bulk ion salts. And if you notice, a lot of these trace elements are also oxidative stress inducers, like the coppers and the zincs and so forth. So too much is, is harmful, but some does need to be there. And one of the other things that's inter interesting is a lot of these trace elements are involved in the enzymology of some of the enzyme that, that have a, uh, enzymes that have a protective effect, such as superoxide dismutase, glutathione synthase, uh, and so forth, use coppers and zincs and seleniums and so forth. So a lot of these trace elements are important from a protective point of view. Sugars obviously are important. Um, we learn in biochemistry that we get much of the energy that cells need from the oxidative breakdown of glucose. Uh, it turns out in cell culture, and again, cell cultures in, in vitro, not in vivo, glucose also results in the production of things like uh, aspartic acid and glutamic acid, which can be inhibitory towards neuronal cells. So serum is also important, and again, it's the serum addition to the basal media that makes a complete media which is capable of uh, promoting growth and, and cell proliferation. I just want to remind you that there's multiple types of serum out there. There's horse serum, there's calf serum, there's fetal bovine serum, which is also called fetal calf serum. We mostly use fetal bovine serum to promote the growth of, of animal cells, and that's because fetal bovine serum um, has the widest range of growth factors. It has the lowest fat and the lowest protein levels of the various sera. And serum provides things such as the attachment factors like vitronectin and fibronectin, collagen that cells need to attach to plastic. They also contain things like the essential lipids and cholesterol and hormones, fat-soluble vitamins, and so forth. It's also important to understand that serum does have unknown components. Um, it's thought that there may be about 10,000 different components in serum. Many of them we know uh, what they do. Many of them we don't. There are negative factors as well as positive factors present in serum. I also want to point out that it's really important, right, that when we grow cells, we keep our, our media the best that we can possibly keep it. One of the ways you can do that is protecting your media from light. Light will damage media, um, and it does it in a fairly uh, short period of time. Here we're looking at some charts where we have media exposed to light or not for a half an hour, two and a quarter, four and a quarter, or six and a quarter hours. And the point is, if you protect your media from light, you get good growth potential. If you expose your media to um, fluorescent light for periods of time, uh, you can see you lose a significant amount of the growth potential. Now, to be fair, this is done with a cell line that's known to be sensitive to changes 
but uh, the example still stands and that light does damage components in the media um, and damages amino acids and vitamins and so forth um, and produces sulfur and some other components which then have a negative effect on your cell growth. So finally, what I'd like to say is that uh, when we do grow our cells, it's important to pick the right media. We want to keep our media in the dark, especially if your media is not a red color. I know many uh, cell culturists, when they work with a serum-free media, they won't even put the lights on in the biological safety cabinet. Generally speaking, we like to minimize the time our media is, 30, uh, is at 37 degrees. One of the reasons for that is that there are components in media that will uh, decompose over time, and the longer we incubate our media at 37 degrees, the faster this happens. This is true with glutamine, amino acids, uh, and, and many other components of media. It's also important not to freeze basal media or media unless specifically uh, that's a specific requirement, and the reason for that is once we freeze media, some of the components in the media, such as amino, amino acids, might precipitate out a solution. Of course, once they do, that you're not going to get them back in, uh, even if you warm up your media, media bottles. I also wanted to mention that you want to go ahead and um, uh, maintain a neutral pH. Uh, if we're adding components back to media and so forth, if we're acidifying amino acids or insulin or something like that, we want to make sure that we uh, add those acidic components uh, slowly to media and allow the media to neutralize the pH. And then I also wanted to point out that it is possible uh, to freeze things like uh, serum and so forth. We should freeze serum uh, in 50 mil aliquots. Uh, one of my recommendations might be to use something like the one-shot serum, um, but try not to freeze and thaw serum multiple times. Thank you.